year the lecture series was organized in a slightly different way than it has been in the past one group organized the the lectures for the entire year typically the grad students do in the fall and the undergrads do in the spring but we had an incredibly dedicated really terrific group of students who organized the series for the full year and before i actually introduce the speaker i want to thank those students and they are yoram lapeer barbara huang jeremy fletcher simon story rachel brunsma colin peoples greg ramirez and jimmy the pope louder um i also want to make a couple of announcements for uh lectures uh, in the following weeks um uh, next week on uh, january 23rd we'll have a speaker from holland you can lease out uh whose work you i hope know and if you don't but you'll certainly know the personality once uh, he comes in lectures so he's quite spectacular uh, figure uh and two weeks later on february 6th uh we'll be uh, we'll, uh rennie ramakers from drogue design uh will lecture um those things aside uh i will i don't want to say very much uh, about uh, our speaker tonight i i i will say that uh, i'm incredibly happy uh, to have her here for a lecture i wish we had her here more often i wish she was in fact here all the time um she's not um our speaker for tonight uh, is lindy roy uh, she has a firm called roy uh she's uh, right now situated in new york she did a bachelor's of architecture uh, from the university of cape town i believe uh, did a master's of architecture at columbia and uh, i was shocked to see in uh, a piece on the architectural record uh, website uh, which i consulted weirdly enough because i actually know lindy fairly well and why you really need to consult the website to interview someone you know is one of the oddities of late no not late 20th century early 21st century life um, in any case uh, i was really shocked to to discover that she had worked or she claims to have worked for 18 offices in her first two years out of school oh, I, didn't, I didn't know that um i met lindy uh, she's one of the first people i met when i went to new york uh, at eisman architects and was completely overwhelmed by her and her work then um all i really want to say about about her work is that uh, and you're going to see i hope lots of it tonight so i'm going to cut this short but the thing that that for me is so kind of amazing um is that lindy is an incredibly uh, sophisticated theoretical person but unlike most people who are theoretically sophisticated she doesn't feel I think, compelled um, to turn that theoretical sophistication and work that looks uh, like it represents theoretical sophistication in fact uh, the theoretical sophistication informs and shapes her work uh, and i think uh, she's one of the few people who have uh, whose work uh, whose actual work matches uh, as i said the sophistication of her of her thinking um well i don't want to say anymore uh, i'm very 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 happy to have lindy roy here and i would like you to help me welcome her here tonight introduction um it's actually it's great being back here i was in the half an hour i had or 45 minutes i had driving over here remembering living here um, I don't know, 10 years ago now for nine months one of the 18 jobs since once i ran out of offices in new york i moved to l.a and landed up working for frank israel for nine months and then moved back to new york where i met michael and peter eisenman's office um, I, what I've done is I've brought a, a lot of slides, um, a bunch of projects, um, some that are current, some that are on hold, some that will never materialize, and some that are in the works. Um, and I think what would be good is maybe just to start um, and see how far I can get through them. Um, and then I would be happy to actually have a conversation afterwards and, and answer any questions you might have. So how do I deal with the light? Can you all hear me? Can you hear? Can you hear me if I stand? Is, is my voice carrying to the back here? Okay. All right. I guess I have to kick this off. 
forward? Um, as I was organizing the slides, I've, I, I, what I've done is some, it's somewhat chronological, um, and it's also like in any, any way of working, as if one project sort of gives rise to some fairly focused research, then the project doesn't materialize, you don't throw that research away, you wait for the next opportunity maybe to see if there's a place to begin to explore it again. So, oops, thank you. The, the first two projects I'm gonna show um, were, uh, one was a proposal, um, it was a sort of limited invited competition for uh, a new boutique for Isimiyaki in um, Tribeca in New York. Um, they landed up going outside the competition, and, and well, not outside it. They, they landed up giving it to Frank Gehry, and the, the project opened a few months ago. Um, and actually, it's a pretty amazing project. We, so the, the slides that you're going to see to begin with are some of the research that we were involved with, um, looking into the, uh, fiber optic, um, optical fibers, and beginning to think of ways of, of using the material that really is source of information, material of information, but in a, in a material way. Um, when we didn't get that, it was almost, we got very attached to that research and we were working on a bar um, in the meat market in New York City, which is where our office is, just sort of in collaboration with our landlords that own uh, a lot of uh, old defunct meat lockers. And it's a neighborhood in the city that's going through radical transformation very, very quickly. Um, and so I'll, I'll begin with those two. So I need to just, if I can, you know, need to be able to see what I'm talking about. Okay, um, fiber optics are the current, are currently the communication medium of the future. Um, they're actually an incredibly efficient and inexpensive material to begin to use as well as, as a material to make things out of. $675 for 9,000 meters in length of, of cable. Um, and there were various properties that we were sort of interested in, um, in the way that light could be emitted from the ends, you could focus light, or you could begin to leak light. Um, and we began the project, um, can we just a little bit light? Just kind of orient myself here. Okay. Um, it was a three-story, this is a section of, of the, the space, a ground level, a basement, and a sub-basement. Um, it was a destination store, a kind of showroom, an administrative area, and the national warehouse. And so really the, the project was, what one was asked to do was to come up with a destination store that was also really reflected the culture of Miyaki um, in the space. And so, the idea of, of thinking about how, how you could unify a space, which is basically two levels below a street level, the idea of thinking of, of ways of bringing light into the space is the next step. Um, so the way we organized it was the ground floor was the store, the, 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 the basement was the administrative offices and, sh and the showroom, um, the uh, space for the show samples, um, and the, the basement was uh, the warehouse. And here you see the same organizational layers, basement, ground, uh, basement, sub-basement, basement, and first. And what we proposed was from a single light source at the back of the store, we, we took a huge bundle of cables, um, 10 foot wide in diameter, split into two, and then fed them through the store, um, right down into the basement and the sub-basement. And we started exploring, this is a, let me find a better way of doing this. Okay. Um, okay, now I'm set. So this is the uh, street, main street, uh, main entrance. At the back of the store is a, a, a light source, which is, it's called a light engine, but basically um, it's a lamp with a reflector and a series of fittings that you could connect a bundle of the cables. And, and at this point, I think we were dealing with a 10-foot bundle. Um, and then that bundle, as it moved, it traveled through a series of comb-like structures that were connected to the beams and columns, the existing beams and columns in the building, and those combs acted as a series of sieves or filters that distributed the cables, um, and they're almost like vermicelli, angel, angel hair pasta thickness cables, um, and they, as they traveled, 
towards the front of the store, they would distribute light in a series of different ways as a curtain, as a series of more um, elaborate fixtures. Um, and then as the, the thinner strands moved to the front, it formed an entry canopy with Isimiyaki, um, the brand, the name, written at the sort of section cut in light at the entrance. Um, and here you see, that could be focused a little bit if possible, um, the back of the store, behind this was, was a large mirror, floor to ceiling mirror was the light engine, so you got a, series, a sense of false perspective, sort of false infinity. The cables being distributed through these combs down into the basement and the sub-basement and then the entry canopy where you had an undifferentiated bundle sort of forming the shape um, as it formed the letters. These are some more studies, again, from the back, looking at the, the front of the store, how you could produce it, how one would begin to work the windows um, with a series of curtains and filters. The light could be, literally, these could be drawn open or closed, and different light effects could be produced. This was a 10-day proposal, um, not too much time. If we could just focus the slide on the, this side a little bit, possible. Should I do it? Actually, that would be good because I think it's something good. That frees me up a bit. Okay, the slide on, the, on, the, on your left is um, the sidewalk of the meat market in New York, this kind of ubiquitous cycle that um, we, our office is located right in the middle of this, and so. Um, become an involuntary vegetarian, sort of lived through this um, for the last 18 months. But it's still a functioning market. Um, most of the guys have been moved out of the city um, as this area up to Hunts Point um, in the Bronx, as this area now is, is beginning to be gentrified. And they basically there are two modes here. One is there's a group that wants to declare a, a historic district, and they want to preserve every building, every cobblestone on the street. Um, and and essentially, these buildings have no historic value per se. They've been refrigerators for the last 80 years. They're rotting, they're falling apart. Um, the other mode is people want to just basically white it out, start again, obliterate any memory of what was there, and essentially turn it into Soho, um, which is happening in, in portions of it. And so we were looking for a way of doing something that, that utilized the infrastructure that's there. Um, and, but was able to transform it into something um, that was true to really the life of the neighborhood now. So what you're seeing here is the track uh, and switch system, and basically meat is brought in off a truck, put onto these tracks on the sidewalk, and then pulled through into the cutting and cooling room. No, actually back. And th this, is, this is the paraphernalia of the infrastructure, um, a series of angles and tracks, and basically a grid that allows you to move um, right from the front of the space continuously right to the back, um, allows you to lift and lower um, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds of meat at a time. So it's an incredibly robust infrastructure. And this was one of the earlier diagrams where we said, look, you know, you've got, basically you've got this clean space um, the floor is sloped to drain in the middle. You've got this really, really robust infrastructure. This is the canopy on the sidewalk. It seemed to make sense to focus design dollars in this zone. And so basically all you would have to do is clean the rest of the space out. Okay? And so what we proposed was going back to the, the fiber optic research. These, things were ha these two projects were happening concur concurrently. There's a, basement, there's a small basement space um, at the front, and so we've located three light engines in the front, um, and basically the light engine is just is a powerful light source with a reflector and a filter. Um, we cut three holes in the ground floor slab, it's showing you where it drains to. We pulled three bundles of fibers, each one, the, the light source had a different color filter on, so there were three different tones. We pulled them up through the hole in three holes in the, in the slab, lifted them above this red grid, which is the track and switch system, and then braided them across the ceiling of the space. 
um, and this was the beginning, the beginnings of the studies of the effects that you had had looking back towards the street where the cables actually form the effect of a kind of glassy curtain um, and that if you, if you um, sand or scrape or distress parts of them, they leak light over their length um, as well as sort of focus it um, to the end. It's okay, you can keep going. And like in the previous project, we looked at how you could actually begin to integrate a graphic into the actual, the graphic, the naming, into the actual form of the entry experience. So the street facade, the name was absolutely linked to your, your, your way into the space. Oh, if you could move that one back, please. Um, and then again, looking at a series of um, taking two strands to the back where there are bathrooms and actually screening the back, um, turning the, the cables into a curtain at that point. Next please. Um, some early elevations where you see this, the existing tracks, the, the cables coming up. What, what we then proposed was because the floor sloped um, and because you had this infrastructure that could suspend a fair weight, what all the tables, um, are small round cast resin um, tables that are suspended from the track system and there are six large red leather chaise lounges that are also suspended from the track system um, and the datum of the fiber optics that run across the top. Next please. And the tables are as they're suspended, they can rotate up or rotate down, so you can vary the height of them from standing, lounging, and sitting. Um, and these little red dots correspond to the grid um, above. This is sort of really intense. <laughs> I'm getting used to this coordination here. Um, and these mark all the possible positions where the tables can be locked into the ground. And so each one of those red dots is actually a threaded hole with a cap and the base of the, the rod of the table can be pulled in, the cap can be closed, so when you're hosing down the floor, you don't land up with a kind of grungy mess, okay. Um, these, this should be a continuous image, but basically there you get the idea, standing, lounging, seated. At this point, the tables were all round, if you want to move to the next one. But then we started moving into a boomerang and a plug shape, so you could orient the bar into a kind of normative restaurant, or you, they could begin to migrate and form longer, continuous strands of tables. Um, and here, yeah, the, the building up of the, the system, basically incredibly simple. And some early studies, a little bit of a focus, looking back towards the street, coming up from the basement of what the feel of the space would be. Um, still at the point when the tables were round. Okay. All right, from dead meat to live meat. Um, if you could just focus this one a little, thank you. This is a project, um, in, in, at, at this point we know it's definitely not gonna happen on this site, and I'll take you a little bit through the history of how, the, how this um, occurred, but at this point we were, were des designing a spa um, in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Botswana is essentially, that is the footprint of Botswana. This is South Africa, this is Namibia, and Botswana is essentially Kalahari Desert, but it has one unbelievable feature. Um, which I'll get to in a, not one, it has many unbelievable features, one significant feature that produces all the others. Um, here you can see the outline of the continent within a cloud um, weather map. Um, and this was the beginning of our research, trying to figure out how you could produce an architecture in an incredibly pristine wetland environment. Um, but it, it had to have an incredibly light touch for environmental reasons, absolutely. There were very stringent regulations that we had to follow. But also, if the company was not successful, they would have to, they would lose their lease after 10 years, and everything on that site would have to be removed. So there were cycles of, temp of permanence and, um, and, um, and aspects of, of, of a temporary nature, in both in a sort of seasonal cycle, according to the tourism industry, but also in terms of the life cycle of this company. Um, this is a, a shot actually from the space shuttle, um, I guess from Columbus, 
And here you can see, this is the Kalahari Desert. These lines are dunes. The Okavango River travels downwards. It hits the Great African Rift Valley, and it shatters into this incredible wetland in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. Normally, deltas occur at the coast. So having an inland delta is, is an extraordinary um, event. This is um, a photograph of, of an area adjacent to the site called the Makari Kari, and it's a salt pan that's the size of Switzerland, with probably no more um, change in elevation than maybe six or eight feet. Um, and it, it was an inland lake um, that dried up thousands of years ago, and it's just this incredible salt flat. Um, and the tour, the, our clients run a tour uh, safari company where you go out into this desert environment on fat four-wheeler, um, actually basically like the bikes that you're seeing in Afghanistan, quad bikes, but not as souped up, um, which are low impact on the environment. And the focus of this form of ecotourism is dealing with desert adaptation. So how, how animals, how life adapts to this extreme environment. The proposal to do a spa in the wetland was to provide the other side, um, which is really what um, Botswana, the tourism industry is known for, which is this incredible wetland that goes from a kind of meandering. This is not land. This is just um, reeds and papyrus. These areas are where their islands are located, and they're not built up by sedimentation. They're actually tectonically built over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years by termites. And so there's this incredible production of actually producing, basically the swarm at work, producing stable ground. Um, here you can see those are islands. This is otherwise just reeds. Um, next, please. Yeah. The only way in to the site is by airplane. Um, and once you get, or, or helicopter, and once you get onto the ground, once you land, you get around in these dugout canoes called Makoros. Um, what you're looking at over here is an elephant track. Each animal has its own route from one water source to the next, kind of elephant highway. Next, please. And here's the delta. Our site is there. And it's right on, you can see, on the migration tracks of elephant and zebra, buffalo and zebra, uh, wildebeest, there should be somewhere, um, uh, elephant, and where the zebra go and where the herbivores go, the large-scale lions, predators, cheetah, um, leopard, hyena follow. And so it's an incredible, um, it's not Disneyland. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible extreme environment. Um, here from the air, you can see the filigree of elephant tracks um, traipsing through. Next. And the section is obviously critically important, but you, we, the, the idea was for us to build on the water and so that you could actually locate um, eight to 10 guest units individually within this papyrus, the, the, the reed growth around in that area are papyrus that grow up to seven or eight feet tall. Um, okay, next. The other incredible feature on the site, what I've talked about, the, the, the ground being tectonically built, these are uh, termite mounds that stick up, um, they pepper the region. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. Most of them are abandoned in, in this area. Um, here's a small village quite close to the site built around sort of a termite mound giving you the finger. But I mean, you can see how, how, how tall that is. Next. Um, and so I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we, part of the research was looking at how hundreds of thousands of non-verbal, fairly unintelligent um, creatures, airborne termites, coordinate their behavior to build these incredible, um, these incredible um, architectures. Basically, the termites in that region are they're, they're fungus farmers. And so the temperature inside, this is one of their mounds, has to be inside the nest. They grow fungus in this area and then there are eggs and there's, there's a whole kind of city of reproduction happening. But the temperature inside the mound has to be sometimes 30 to 40 degrees cooler than on the exterior. And so these large chimney structures are basically elaborate air conditioning systems. I can talk to you a little bit after if there's time for questions, I'll go into it a little bit more. Um, but basically they use, the termites use pheromones and they, they 
pheromones are impregnated in the dirt that they pick up and build the mound out of, and the pheromones attract other insects, other termites. And so kind of temporal um, uh, scaffold evolves by these, these pheromone um, diffusion gradients that get set up in a site where the termites are building. Um, actually, let me just go back one sec, which is really what's being shown here, the diffusion grad gradients that, that this structure exists and it guides the layering and dropping of the dirt to form these intricate architectures. And so when the wind blows, you get an imprint of the environment literally on the way that the nest might be shaped. Um, I'll come back to this, but this, um, this was part of a, a research was just absolutely serendipitous and fantastic that the site was peppered with termite mounds because sitting back in New York, um, I was very involved in looking at swarm behavior and, and how, um, basically how non-verbally communicating agents distributed um, in an environment are able to produce coherent, um, coherent form, whether it's a form of communication or, or physical form. Um, keep going. Um, and these were some of the studies of, of starting to think about how we could produce an infrastructure below water and an experience above water because we basically had to lay down pipes and septic tanks and pump systems in the water in an incredibly efficient way. Um, so there was a series of, of, of really pattern making exercises of understanding how you could produce a coherent, a very, very constrained, very, very specific but flexible system. Next. Um, this, you'll see in the next slide, this is what a, what a landing strip looks like um, on, on the site. Next. So the site plan, there's a large island that's not showing up in the slide with a landing strip on it um, from a previous camp. Um, and then there are one, two, one, two, three, four termite mound islands sticking up out of the water. These propeller-shaped white things are the guest units, and they are linked below water with this dotted grid of um, pipes and pumps. Um, solid waste is then sort of separated and removed, and the liquid waste is then pumped onto the main island into a leach field. Um, the series, the the, 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 the units above water are connected by these floating um, arced walkways. And what set up the geometry of below water was the idea of wanting to locate each guest unit within a clearing in these eight, actually in this area, 10 foot papyrus beds. And so that, that really defined the geometry of the, of the upper, um, the above water. Below water was just a very, very dumb, simple grid. So back to the earlier diagrams, this unit would be connected to that unit underwater, but this unit would be connected to that unit above water. And so out of that, you're able to produce a kind of polyrhythmic, in a very, very simple way, system where you had very expedient linkages, and then you had very kind of picturesque and experiential uh, open-ended linkages that also fluctuated as the water level changed. Um, so throughout the season, the accessibility on the site will change. Next. Um, that's another image of the same. These were some of the studies that we looked at sort of early on looking at using particle animation, just trying to find ways where you could calibrate the, the above water sort of you know, natural geometry to a very sort of um, a very rigid prescribed geometry by our environmental engineer. Next. Um, and here again, you have the system of pumps and tanks. Next. And then the forms. Um, we started looking at, um, we were really interested in using materials, obviously, that were indigenous to the site and vernacular modes of construction. Um, and thatch, these, are, these aren't um, reed thatch, these are a little bit more rigid, but in the area there's incredible thatch work that happens in, in Mozambique, um, the country to the east. Um, and we were very interested in using a team of guys that had done some incredible work. Um, but the idea was, there, were, there was a two-fold strategy. One was to, to use, to use um, traditional techniques 
but to introduce geometries that would produce new forms. So there's a reason why thatch looks, thatch huts look the way they do, because thatch has to drain at a very steep angle, and so it makes sense to make cones. But if you take the geometry of that angle, a 40, 42 degree angle, and sweep it using sort of basically a hyperbolic paraboloid, you actually can produce quite free um, forms, and that was how we landed up with the, the next. Um, those propeller shapes, which came from um, some research also looking at seed pods, how seed pods propel themselves away from the tree so it wouldn't compete with the mother tree for resources. Part of the agenda from, of, from our clients was that when you fly over this, it shouldn't look like a resort. Um, this thing really needs to look like it's in motion. It's something that you, you, you see, you, you glimpse from the air, but it's not something that's static. So these were some of the early diagrams that we were looking at in, in how you could actually produce, um, using the logic of the geometry uh, of the technique of construction, um, produce other, other forms. Next, please. Next. And these were early, early studies, again, um, looking at uh, really the cycles of the site. So sedimentation, I, I think this might be too small for you guys to see at the back. Um, but really, sort of each, each image we produced about 10 of these was a kind of key of elements, um, a sort of checklist for the client. Um, and then slowly the, the actual architecture began to find itself within this sort of meshwork of forces. So here we were looking at sedimentation, fluctuating water levels. Here we were looking at rainfall. And you can't really see this, but the magnetic fields that the termites also use to orient themselves when they're building these mounds. This site got flooded um, hundreds of years ago, perhaps. Um, and so these mounds, just the tips of them stick up out of the water. Next. Um, and here we were looking at these, really these, these temporal forms, of, of basically a bird of prey economizing energy by riding an airfoil. So over the water, the warm air rises and then drops. All this bird does is it flies around in circles and it just rides the, it rides the airfoils and maintains its, um, really conserves its energy and maintains its surveillance. Um, each unit consists of um, a propeller-shaped thatch roof. This is a solar collecting drum, which is basically an aluminum drum with a lens. Um, it was actually a plastic um, um, lens on the top. Water is pumped up from below, heated during the day, and then fed when you come back from your game drives or tracking game into um, this floating fiberglass um, spa element, which is basically a large tub. Um, if you want to go to the next. And here you see, again, the relationship between what happens above water and the pipe and pump system. The water is actually that deep. We exaggerated it for pure effect in this instance. But um, this, is, this unit then gets linked to this island and then connects to um, a unit over there. Next. And um, these were sort of the, the, the later images. Um, following the roof profile is an aluminum track and there's uh, there are two layers. One is high-tech tent fabric that can be enclosed um, and so that you could close off this part and because this exceeds the, the floor area, you'll end up enclosing an area of water in the space as well. Um, up a few steps is a, a more sort of enclosed area, really psychologically to make people feel a little bit more secure and that's the area that you sleep in. Um, and then there was a second layer of mosquito netting um, that would be draped around that. Next. Um, the last element, and this again so shows sort of the obsession with the, the septic system and the um, water supply and waste. Um, the delta water is incredibly pristine and um, the, the clients wanted to be able to swim in it, but there's the psychological fear of crocodile because there are crocodile in, in the area and hippo. And so what we, what we proposed was this lap pool that um, was actually crocodile resistant. And there was a guy down in Florida who gave us the compressive strength of alligator jaws. And out of that, we were able to figure out the steel frame um, with a really fine but strong mesh that, that wrapped it. So it was a kind of sieve. And then there's a wood deck that ends in a, sort of a bent section that acts as a chaise. 
with a little outboard motor on it. And so this pool can be docked under the shade of one of the roofs or actually can be navigated. This is a grossly out of proportion. <laughs> this is a frog. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, okay, next. After that, um, as, as actually, while we were working on this, we, we entered a competition for a low income, uh, moderate income housing um, project in Houston. Um, we were one of the winners, and the, the project is actually due to start construction um, at, at, at in the spring. Um, but basically, it was um, uh, the, the, a community organization that was linking into a, into a voucher program, and it was basically providing down payments for $85,000 uh, three bedroom, two bathroom house, uh, 1,500 square feet. I mean, it's cheaper to build in Houston, but um, $85,000, it was a challenge. Um, and having been looking at tropical environments, Houston is a tropical environment, um, granted an urban environment. And so we, we, we'd really done a fair amount of research on passive cooling um, for the spa. And so what we started looking at was taking a basic shotgun shack roof lifting up the front of it and twisting it into the prevailing wind so at least the, the house didn't have to be air conditioned 12 months a year what happens is people uh, these houses are built with tiny windows this this area or this category of housing is essentially the domain of fairly schlocky developers where the windows and doors are tiny and generally the house isn't allowed to operate or breathe other than with air conditioning and we wanted to offer an alternative, well, at least the opportunity um, to, 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 to be able to live in it without that. What happens is people move into the houses, can't afford to pay for the air conditioning, and, and basically the, the architecture doesn't allow any, any other possibility. Um, next. Um, so here, this is probably the easiest to explain, a very simple plan, kind of um, master bedroom, bathroom, two kids' rooms, another bathroom, kitchen, living, dining. And then there was the spine of uh, ceiling fans that moved through the house that ends in a bug zapper on the back porch. Next. And here are the two sections. Um, on the one side, you have a completely flat, two-dimensional uh, roof surface. On this side, you see it twisting into the wind. It lifts up to deal with the infrastructure of the street and to sort of draw it through to the zapper on the, on the back porch. Um, next. fairly brutal uh, elevation that was fairly early on, but the roof on the one side pulls down and wraps around to where the carport and the entry to the kitchen is, and then on the other side, this Viroc, which is a kind of cement um, board, really inexpensive, we use it as floor, interior, exterior, and wall surface, so the wall along that side is the Viroc, it's just these two L's. Next. Oh, I'm going to just show you very, very, because I want to get onto this, the newer stuff. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Okay. Um, this was a project, a proposal that um, got put on hold but then led to something else. Um, in 1998, um, when the Panama Canal was going to be handed back to Panama, it actually was handed back in 1999, um, Frank Gehry. Um, his wife is actually Panamanian, and he spent a lot of time down there. And when, when it became clear that, well, when the plans were being developed for the land that lined the canal um, that would be given back over um, from the from the U.S. military to, to Panama, the most grotesque, sort of really, really bad casino-type development was, was planned. And so he was he agreed to come down there and, and participate in a in a symposium to rethink an ecotourism infrastructure. Um, and so a couple of architects went down with him and wh while I was down there, um, I met um, a client, uh, somebody who landed up, uh, became a client, somebody who had found this US radar tower in the middle of the jungle, that's the Panama Canal. Um, it, it was a geotangent, if we can move to the next one. Basically this incredible tower that was used to initially to police the canal and then to, to patrol drug trafficking from Colombia had this huge geotangent dome, a kind of bucky-like dome on the roof, um, but he had converted into an amazing bird watching um, um, hotel. And there were these, these, this platform for fuel tanks that were adjacent to the site and everything was done by military engineers, so it was incredibly oversized, there was enough power on the site to basically 
supply a small city. And what he wanted to do was to create a kind of overflow space for the guests on the surface. And so we basically, what, if we can move to the next one, um, it was a large roof, essentially a large roof um, Kevlar, uh, uh, Teflon um, uh, tensile structure that got stretched over a deck over these uh, fuel tanks, fuel tank housings. Next. Oh, I'm just going to flash through these. This was a proposal for the New York Times, Times capsule that um, the Natural History Museum ran a competition for. Um, Calatrava's one actually was built. If you go to the Natural History Museum, you can see it. But it was a proposal for a, for a capsule that would be monumental, that would be opened in the year 3000. And we were interested in producing not the monumental capsule, but basically the anti-monument and sort of following another kind of swarm mode to produce a thousand of these little egg-shaped capsules that would be sealed, um, if we move to the next one, um, sealed with um, goods from the museum in the exterior, and then there'd be a series of compartments, one for every generation, dated and yeared, yeared, dated with years, um, from now to the year 3000. And the idea was there would be a lottery, they would distribute a thousand of these throughout the city. If you won one, actually half of them would be sold for a huge amount of money to offset it. Um, and if you got one, your handprints would be cast in the exterior and also provides the way of actually cracking the egg open. So the idea was the big problem with the time capsule was how do you, how do you ensure that the capsule is going to be, be around a thousand years from now? Um, and you can't rely on any, on any institutions necessarily to guarantee it. Who knows if the New York Times will be around? Um, and so we thought, well, how do, what, what, what could you piggyback onto? So the idea of owning an incredibly public object um, and filling it with your own family um, information um, and data seemed to be an incredible, you know, seemed to be a, a way to motivate this thing for the first few generations. And then as it got filled with more and more familial information, the motivation would still be there to maintain it, hopefully, for totally year 3000. We, we, next. Um, you can flip through these quite quickly. Okay, um, this is um, a project that was completed um, over the summer at PS1. Um, it's the um, Museum of Modern Art in, in conjunction with PS1 runs this competition. Um, and what, what you get to do is design the space in the courtyard of PS1, which is a fantastic um, contemporary art center in Queens. Uh, in New York um, to run for three months over the summer and to basically be the venue for this music festival, um, live DJs and performance um, every Saturday where five or six thousand club kids basically go from four in the afternoon, three in the afternoon till nine at night and then go out afterwards. And so um, what we, I'll, I'll take you very quickly through what we proposed. Um, these were some of the conceptual images. That's, that's okay. The idea of an urban, clearly they gave us the theme Paradise Island and we were really interested in getting away from the cuteness of paradise and creating a, definitely an urban environment that produced um, a respite you know, from 90 degree humid summers in New York. Next. So we looked at Melnikov's sleep laboratory projects. Um, I, you guys should go and take a look at them at some point in the library, but basically this sort of obsessive um, project from the 1930s where sleep was being studied and um, there were a series of lab two laboratories with these hidden control rooms and, and um, technicians would um, filter different um, scents and oxygen content and sounds and various sort of stimuli through the space and record the effects on the sleeping subjects. The other thing we looked at was the movie Coma, the idea of a very light infrastructure um, of bodies suspended in space. Next. And so what we did uh, after certainly the Africa project was begin to consider, this is the footprint of the courtyard, looking at it as um, basically a, a, a heat a weather map, a climatic map where you had high pressure and low pressure. And the idea was to just reduce the temperature. It's incredibly hot there. Um, and so what we did was we introduced these moments of water in various, you know, in, in solid pools of water, sprays, like showers of water and an infrastructure of fine mist. And we also produced wind, uh, and I'll show you how we did that. Um, and the idea was also how you could organize bodies in space so that during the week 
um, it would make kind of entry space to the museum. On the weekends when there are literally five or 6,000 people, these peop the bodies could be moved or could move so that the site became more diffuse and also there's an opportunity for these smaller groupings and party spaces to happen. So what we proposed was um, a series of these large sunbeds, but let me get to um, the, the, the weather. Um, we, we introduced, there were three pools. There was an infrastructure of agricultural, basically a cheap agricultural pump. Basically, you, you, you get $50,000 and three months to go from an idea to an opening day, um, and which is an, it's an unbelievable opportunity um, because architecture is so slow. And to, to be able to come up with, with an idea and to build it, I mean, there was a fantastic team of student volunteers and um, basically slogging in 90 degree heat um, through June to make a July 1st um, opening. Um, so this is the footprint of the courtyard, the three pools. This wall had 45 oscillating fans on the wall that produced wind. Um, and this is the spray infrastructure. Each one of these is a sunbed, and I'll show you. They rotate um, and move. You can adjust them. And this is the dance floor area. And here you see um, some sectional elevations of that. In this is all the electricity for the fans. Here you see all the fans on the wall. The idea was to sort of make it look like a kind of urban creeper. Um, and this is the spray infrastructure. And I'll get to what those things are in a minute next. Uh, in three dimensions, here you see the sunbeds. Each one was um, fixed to the ground on a single point and, and a wheel. And it could be, if we move to the next one. Oh, dear. Oh, we'll come back to that. Um, basically, the sunbeds could rotate. So you could track the sun and move in and out of the shade. These were our competition, some of our competition drawings. Um, Basically, all we knew was we wanted to make shade. There was no way we could afford to do that, and we wanted to make wind. Um, and so we ran through a series of scenarios of what the, the space would be like. Next. Uh, in this one, we show the three pools. We found these incredible pools for $350 online that basically, when, when they arrive, they look, like, they look like condoms. They're flat with a ring around them. You inflate the ring, then you fill it with water, and the ring rises, and you have this incredibly taut pool. And it came with a filter and a pump and a ladder and everything. It was a total deal. And then they ended up donating it to us. But um, uh, they also, the museum wanted us to deal with um, the scaffold that existed, wrapping the building to protect while they were while they were repointing the brickwork. So we took these two huge wave graphics and made this sort of false perspective out of them. Here you see one of the pools um, in that area where the waves are. Next. Um, here, are, this is beginning to look at the, the sunbeds, um, all on sort of single pivots. Um, this was one of the, again, our, one of our competition entries. We actually, it was sort of a lesson to learn. We got the topic wrong. The, the theme was Paradise Island. I thought it was Fantasy Island. I hated the idea of fantasy because it sounded cute. So we went through this whole thing of sort of subverting it and changed the F to a PH. So it had a kind of medical, fat farm, hip hop thing. And, walked into the jury and they all kind of smirked and I didn't realize that we'd actually got the theme wrong and had gone through this incredibly elaborate um, mode of sort of subverting it but in the end basically they said we could come up with whatever we wanted um, but they wanted this sort of series of, of elements so we went through this it was an actually very interesting process of taking a general design agenda and try and running it through a series of filters of a, of a one of a better word, a theme, and seeing how robust the idea was and how malleable it was. Um, in, in this one, we had these sort of shrouded figures, um, the idea that you were being tended to, and um, it got taken very literally by the museum, and they landed up, the, all the security guards landed up wearing these long white um, <laughs> Egyptian jalapas, um, these long white dresses in the end, and they were not happy. Um, but that, wasn't, that was not our idea. Next. Um, here, that's what I was looking for. So here you see each one of these is essentially a hammock structure um, tensioned on, on a steel frame with a wheel. Um, this is the housing that, that holds the shade and also holds the pipe, the infrastructure of the, um, the pipes that's producing spray. And each individual hammock has its own individual spray atomizer that so you could lie, um, as you were lying, you could spray yourself. 
I'll get to what those things are in a moment. Here you can see in elevation now against the fan wall, um, all the hammocks. Next. Um, again, another, we, we had to produce kind of publicity stuff while we were trying to figure out how to build this. I mean, all of this was happening in three months. So it was slightly delirious. These were actually used to build it from. These pink things, as they were known as, um, were basically this idea of trying to make a kind of communal sort of parties, not com kind of party space that was a little bit more private. And so these were 16 foot diameter PVC tubes that are really flexible. Um, seamed, um, were basically threaded through these um, um, very, very light iridescent polyester um, pink um, scrims. Next. Um, you can flip through these quite quickly. And this is the actual installation. And here you can see the pink things. They're quite, when the wind hits them, they got quite flexible. The spray, uh, the neoprene headrests on the sunbeds, they were designed to, to have eight people sitting on them. The fan wall products that we also came up with next. Um, uh, part of the initial pH sort of medical idea were these bags that got filled with Gatorade. We landed up getting a, a sort of an extreme sport company to sponsor it, and they, they retrofitted these bags and branded them for us um, with PS1. Here's inside one of the pink pieces um, with the, the atomizer next. We also designed a swatch. Um, we were asked to, but they couldn't get into production fast enough. Basically, the idea of that was also to cool you down. So this is a gel pad. Um, and the swatch, you can squeeze a, you can squeeze a, you can freeze a swatch. And so these swatches were to be sold on ice at the bar. And when the gel pad got cold, you would wear it inwards on your wrist and cool you down. Once you got the event was over, the one was PS1. You might get rid of the gel pad and still have a fairly sort of minimal watch. These were going through a series of um, looking at those um, platypus bladder bags. Next. And some more of, of installation on, on an off day. Next, please. Um, the bar, there had to be a bar that, you know, on the weekends there'd be thousands of people. During the week there'd be a few hundred people. You didn't want the space to look like an unused large space for large people. So everything had to have a double. Um, use so the bar, the face of the bar was mirrored. So during the week when the bar wasn't functioning, it would um, function as a, a mirrored surface for the for the hammocks. Next, um, next. The <laughs> looking very pissed off. Um, uh, <laughs> The fans were all on tension cables weighted with these dumbbell weights, and so that, and these were the, the, the feeds of electricity, and so they created this, um, basically they would start to rotate, they would reverberate, and you would get them rotating like a peanut gallery, watching, watching the audience. Next. And this is on one of the weekends when it gets pretty packed, and basically the architecture, the design disappears, which was pretty fantastic. Next. And, um, during the week, it's also used by kids in summer camp. So the, the thing had to function in a lot of different ways. Next. Next. OK, next. Oh, this very, very quickly again is a project um, we were working on. In, it's done in London for a self-storage company. It was a branding um, project um, that we we landed up working in collaboration with Bruce Mao Design. If you want to go to the next one. Um, it's a self-storage company that um, was growing and spreading um, into the rest of Europe. And so what we came up with was a very simple modularized system. They were moving from service into a retail mode. Um, and what we, what we produced for them was a, a module that could fit onto a truck, um, a, a series of elements that fit together, a kit of parts, the storefront, the security interface between the store and the storage space, um, a security scrum with monitors um, on it, and each thing was was scaled and sized to the graphic program that could be um, would be applied to it. So here you're looking through. This would be plugged into a huge warehouse building. The entrance, and then the second one for the back of the security cameras. Next. Oh, we can quickly change. Um, thanks. Any questions in the meantime? 
um, what I'm going to, what I'm not going to go through, I'll, I'll flip quite. Um, we, we're working on a project um, it was in collaboration with Richard Mizrak, who's a photographer um, who shoots um, really landscapes that have been decimated by the federal government or by the military. Um, he was focusing on this area between Baton Rouge and New Orleans called Cancer Alley, where um, there's a huge concentration of petrochemical companies. So I'm not going to be able to get into that project, but I'll flip through some of the, the images of what we're involved with with him. Um, do you want to go to the next one? What happened was um, the, 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 the government opened, it's a really brutal sort of survival of the fittest um, mode. The government owns and controls the site correctly, it's a pristine wetland. And every year they open up a series of sites for tourism safari companies to come in. And every 10 years, if you're not performing, if the business is not doing well, or you've got environmental, um, you haven't performed um, according to the guidelines, you cannot renew your lease and a new company can come in. And it's an incredibly corrupt system and our clients are sort of a young young company and um, they, we, we weren't allocated the site um, two years in a row that we needed that had a, the correct depth of water. So there's a private um, investor now and they're looking for a, a site. It won't be in the delta, it'll be in a river site um, in an area that sort of opens up but it doesn't have the sa exactly the same properties. Um, as, as the delta, which is, but you know that that that's where it's at now. Oh dear. Um, I'm, I'm going to flip very very quickly to a house um, that we're working on in Sagaponic um, in New York. Um, it's a developer who's invited. A I think there are 34 architects each to, to design a house and the ideas. It's in the Hamptons, which is, um, I'm going to flip very quickly. In fact, you can flip quite, there's another one as well. Oh dear. Um, it's okay. Um, the, the Hamptons is full of these overblown mansions and um, it's, it's basically the Mac Mansion Syndrome is what it's called. This, this kind of nouveau riche, really, really grotesque, overscaled um, properties. Um, what you're looking at here doesn't have anything to do with it, but I'll just ramble on a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the developer wanted to um, build, to return to the idea of a beach house um, and create these more modest scale. Um, projects, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, these are some of the companies that are, are located along the river. Um, this is not the Hamptons. This is Louisiana, Baton Rouge, New Orleans. And this is the density of the companies. Almost everything you touch, from cosmetics to plastics, to, has passed through um, this area. Um, next. These are some of the photographs um, that, that Richard Bizrak took of, of, the, of Cancer Alley. This is a pipeline going through um, one of the swamp areas. Um, Exxon fencing off property through the water. Next. Um, refineries right in front of, um, literally in, in front of um, plant life that's kind of surviving in, in a toxic environment. This is an, a cemetery of a, of a community that was displaced to build this refinery. I can't do this project. I mean, it's, it's an emergent, something that we've been working on um, for about 18 months. It's too dense to really go into it in too much, much detail. Um, but it's an incredibly complicated, um, it, it, this stretch is also where all the plantation houses are. So it's an unbelievable cut through American history, slavery, um, through the first slave rebellions happened um, very close to that area, very close to this area. Um, it's, it's also an unbelievable sort of hotbed of you know, Cajun culture, jazz, blues. It's, it's an unbelievable sort of concept of, of 
amazing tourism opportunities, unbelievably sort of polluted and toxic environment and sort of destitute communities that are living um, where the sugar, and sugar, plant, sugar plantations that are still in existence there. Um, and what, what Richard Misra, what he was interested in doing was sort of making a, a, a fairly grand proposal, um, a, a kind of reclamation of that area um, with sort of large in institutional buildings, maybe museums, or that would somehow connect it to a tourism network. I wasn't so sure, and it's, it's something that we're moving through now, but we went down there and just started researching it and started documenting what we were finding next. Um, and it essentially looked at what brought the petrochemical companies there in the first place, the river, the natural resources, and the most important things were the tax, the subsidies that the, tax, that the state of Louisiana gave. This is the average of state subsidies. Um, that's Louisiana, um, almost double uh, Utah, which is the next state. And so the, we were looking to generate um, move through the information and produce these diagrams that actually that encapsulated moments of why this place is what it is. Um, and to draw these large timelines from, if you go to the next one, um, literally from, you know, the, the, looking at the geology where, where petrochemicals or with, when um, natural gas and oil is being formed, you're talking about these vast timelines. And so we sort of tracked um, literally this is flipped, but you can see this should be the other way around. That's Africa. This is Pangaea. Um, and that little indentation is um, the, begin that's the, the location of the delta. So trying to, trying to really understand what this place was like when the oil reserves were being formed. Next. Um, and looking at the river. Next. You can just flip through these quite quickly. Formation of oil and gas. Next. 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 Um, starting to move into the individual sites. These are satellite photographs that sort of located every single aspect of the refinery and then diagram the processes of what, what was actually happening on the site, how many people were employed. Um, you know, 225 acres employed 1,000 people. That's okay. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, next. Next. Um, next. Next. There's a bucky full of dome on the site. I mean, there's this incredible dome that was built by the Union Tank for the Union Tank Car Company. Next. Um, um, it's it's called Devil Swamp. It's about uh, half an hour out of Baton Rouge. Yeah. Next. And part of the proposal then was to start to, to find ways of, of providing much needed infrastructure to the local community and to tourism. Um, these are all flipped, they're upside down. But basically what we did was we took the module of the, the barge on the Mississippi River, which is ubiquitous on the river. Um, there, there, there are thousands of them and we programmed them with library, computer centers, sports facilities, community vegetable gardens, the, the ground is toxic in, in certain places, in, in, in dense areas along um, much of the school districts in, in that area. So this set of barges were programmed with local community facilities, and this edge were, were um, this series were programmed with tourism, the, a motel, a jazz cafe, of course parking, movie theater, landscape. Then the idea was these, these would be put on, diff on timetables calibrated to the school system and to tourism, and they could then be ganged together to form these larger landscapes. Um, the, the, the school stuff could move up and down the river in a weekly cycle and serve as a series of schools, um, going from Baton Rouge down to New Orleans, and the tourism stuff would move up from New Orleans um, up to Baton Rouge. Um, next. Okay, this is the house. Um, okay, I'm going to do this in five minutes. Um, this is the house. This is the house. This is the, this is, uh, the agenda of the developer was to come up with less, more modestly priced, modestly scaled projects um, in this area called Sagapon, the town called Sagaponic in the Hamptons. Um, and uh, this is the approach view. Um, I'll, I'll take you to some of the, we'll get to some of the ideas in a moment. Uh, next. Um, we were looking for a way of, 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 of finding a very basic section 
that would produce an enclosed environment, but that would also expand out into the, into the garden. So there were a series of these S-frames, um, a series of floors of, of concrete slabs that would roll into the house and out of the house. Um, and these are little scenarios, um, which I won't go into now, of, of what actually happens um, when the driveway turns into the entrance next. And then those wood, those um, steel S's are clad in wood um, strips that some of them at window, window height are operable, that operate as louvers. Um, they wrap all the way around the S. And the idea there was, that the first image that I didn't talk about was a kind of patterned, um, striated pattern, um, which was actually a piece of fabric from Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we were interested in producing elevations that would change um, over, over time as the house was, was used and used in different seasons. Next. Um, and then there was an, a second, um, second element was this the, a lap pool that moved from the garden into the house and then wound, folded up in the house and housed all the recreational bathing, steam rooms, all the water-related programs. Um, so here, there's the pool extends out there, this is a bar, um, this is now inside the house, these are the two bathrooms, um, this is a little space um, adjacent to the bedroom, I'll get to a plan in a moment, next. Um, closer approach views, so here you see the, the pool basically moves in from there, the S's move in that direction and then perpendicular to that to make the master bedroom suite above, next. These are probably too light to see, but again, the, the glass line of the house is over here. This is an outdoor terrace above. This is an outdoor terrace. This is the dining area that rolls out to the garden. This was a very early model, and the pool that moves into the house. Next. Um, the section of the S's and the pool that intersects with that. Um, the louvered system. Next. 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 Um, some of the sections now are trying to figure out the, the materials, so the, the driveway with the dining room, the pool, the kitchen that turns to the dining room and an outside barbecue area, next. From the garden side, a roll-up glass, roll-up garage door that drops down and closes off the pool or lifts up and makes that an outdoor space, next. And a view from the garden looking at the pool moving into the house. Uh, master bedroom, terrace above, dining room, um, the wet bar, and this is the, the glass door that drops down. We're halfway through CDs on this now. Next. Next. A view from the garden at night with the pool moving through and the master bedroom, living room below, and then the water element moving up through the house. Next. And this lastly, this is a project we're working on now. Um, we've been on it for about six weeks. It's a project for an extreme ski hotel in Valdez, just south of Valdez, Alaska. Extreme skiing is basically adrenaline junkies, world-class skiers, uh, people who want to ski virgin slopes get flown up by helicopter to inaccessible peaks. And then they are, they, the helicopter lands and they, they ski down next. And this company is currently operating on the site out of cabins, um, out of these cabins. Um, they want to build a heliport and a, and a, with, a, with a hotel that's attached to it. Um, this is, I guess, site clearance in Alaska. Next. Um, these are some of the, the initial diagrams of, of the site. Um, the Alaska pipeline runs right past over there. And it's a, another building that gets approached from the air. So. Very, very simply, there are three heliports. It's a raised heli um, pad for security and control reasons, three landing pads, a maintenance um, hangar, and then the hotel intersects with that, the control room and a bar above there, and then a series of programs that take you, as you're moving from the hotel, underneath the structure, sort of preparing you for um, the really dangerous um, events of skiing, where you're dealing with avalanches and um, next. I just grabbed these from, from, from the computer. These were fairly early. Um, next. These, this is sort of where it is right now. So approaching it from the air, 
um, and as that's the, the shadow of the helicopter, as you're coming in lower, the roof of, and it's an area, it's another extreme site, 10 feet, they get 100 feet of snow. You know, so there's, a, there's at least a 10 foot snow, uh, section of snow on the site in winter. They get 20 hours of sunlight in summer. Um, in, when winter's over in a month, the snow melts and the site floods. When the floods go, because you've got 20 hours of sunlight, there's just this voracious plant growth. So within a week, you'll get you know six foot high field of bright blue flowers. And so you know, trying to build something that 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 works. I mean, the, the, the two the, the two owners of the pro of, for the project. One is a weekend warrior, sort of avid skier um, enthusiast, but he's a businessman. And the other guy. Um, who is um, the skier, the, the unbelievable guide with a paramilitary, with a military background, unbelievably, unbelievable program to generate sort of this language of control and a series of, really the project gets, gets divided into zones of hazard, um, you know, areas where you can't go, where you can go, where you can go under certain, uh, under certain conditions. Um, this roof would get covered um, by snow and before you can go up in the helicopters, You've got to do avalanche. The guide is the guy that goes down first, and so he's dependent on the clients if an avalanche comes to pull him out. So he's very interested in making sure they know how to deal with the avalanche detection um, gear. And so before the flight, they'll bury um, a knapsack with a, with a beeper, um, with a set, not a sensor, with a signal on this roof. And you know the crew that the group of five guys that are going to go out there then go and, and try and find it. So. There are all sorts of programs that are actually linked to the, the roof of the building next. Um, and not, not, not to forget sort of the heroic shot when you come back after skiing and you've got this, you know, the, the photo opportunities that are, that are necessary. And um, what's going to happen is the, the project now is developing to this is actually going to be a hub for other ski operators. And so it's got, a, it's got larger and um, in summer there's boating and activity that happens. And so the space below the raised heliport would be used um, for storage for the summer activity. Um, the, the maintenance vehicles travel up through this ramp around to the top. This is the hotel. Snow would cover it up to that height. That would be the datum of snow in winter. Next. And oh, there you see the, the ramp going up. Um, okay, that's it, I think, for now. Thank you. You're very patient. Um, it started, the, the spa was a project we did, I, I really I started it before we, I even had an office, sort of started in 97 and just started it. Um, and the, the clients were friends of mine, very old friends, and so we just sort of invented this project. It got into a couple of magazines here, and actually the client for this project saw that and had been into the Delta and could not believe that you know, knows the architecture in that area and said, you know, in a couple of years, I'm going to be ready to do this project and I'm going to contact you. Um, and that, that's what happened. Um, but it's, it's a strange, I mean, it, it's a question I get asked quite a bit because, you know, there's a tendency to sort of not want to scare people away or, you know, because it's not for everyone. And, but the thing is, I think you've got to do, got to do what you do. And, you know, right now we're, I mean, we're working on a range of things. We're doing a showroom and a retail store for Vitra, um, the European furniture company in New York. Um, and that's due to open in June, another incredibly fast, um, you know, it's not, a, and what we showed them was the stuff. So you never know, you never know
know, it's people already see what it is that you're, you're doing, but it's what it is. I mean, the dirty little secret of that project was it was unfunded, and I we worked on it in between things over summer, um, and it's, that's why it's taken so long. Simply because when Mizra contacted me, I just would have jumped at an opportunity to work with him. I didn't think about you know naively what it would actually cost to produce it, and so we just decided. I went down there, put it on a credit card, and. Um, <laughs> And actually, last month, you know, that's it. We've sort of produced this material, and it's going to now be shaped into a book project. Um, so, and the other projects, you know, you know the bar project was a, way, a matter of convincing our, the client that he should do this, and that we would help him set up the management structure. And so, you know, I think when you're starting, everything, basically, I think what I've been focused on for the last two years when, when I set up this company more formally, is just doing what it takes to kind of get the attention of someone that maybe wants to do to do something. So they paid us a, a tiny fee and then I agreed to do it as sweat equity, so I'd be a partner in, in the project, in, in the actual bar. If it's, if it was more important for me to get those ideas out and be working and, you know, and what's happened is it does become real. There's a very strange, I don't recommend, you know, I don't, it's, you, you, but, the, but the Cancer Rally project was another, I mean, I, I was so blown away when I went down there, and it just seemed, I applied for grants, we didn't get any, I mean, you know, it's now I think if we applied for book grants, we probably get, because there's just, I mean, there's a ton of material, video, and, and his, his photographs are extraordinary. Um, and then, you know, the other stuff are competition, but it, it, I think it's just a matter of work, just wanting to work and smoke and mirrors and kind of, you know, like fake, you know, the, the London project, the storage project, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, and, I mean, I, I was working out, basically it was myself and, and, a, and one guy working out of my apartment, and we were talking to this massive real estate, you know, REIT, a real estate investment trust, this huge, Know, international corporation and convinced them to fire the architects, to fire Sachi, and to bring Bruce Mao on board. And, and, and it worked because I was always flying. I just got on cheap flights and flew to London and sort of moved it through. And then they had a huge board meeting um, which they had to present work for. And I think they got really nervous. They realized, we don't know who this person is. So they flew three of their guys over on Concord. Um, like the week before, and we were literally in a meat packing. Where I felt so we moved into a space that was literally in a where I mean, a meat was one of those meat in the morning. You had to like close your nose and sort of fight your way through meat. And these three guys arrived, and we actually, yeah. You know, well, I won't go into too much detail, <laughs> but um, but these are class. I mean, these are classic stories. They're, you know, you'll, you'll hear people tell these stories of filling an office full of people so that for those days so it's I'm sure you guys have done that I did that when I was a student you know and the, the thing is you know you can do the work it's a matter of kind of cap capturing someone's um, attention I mean after that site visit those things definitely after that office visit there were other there was other fallout they knew that they could mess they could mess with me because I would have no apps they could see I had no recourse you know the trouble did start after that. <laughs> but it, you know, it mattered starting that collaboration and doing that project and you know, we got paid for the work we did. Anyway, that's too, that's too much information. <laughs>